Hello everyone, this is John Buck uh, with another Discrete Time Linear Systems video continuing our Z-Transform story with another example. Uh, if you haven't already seen the definition of Z-Transform video and the first example, strongly recommend you stop here, go back and watch those, and then you'll be caught up uh, and you'll see this one without any spoilers to our, our big story. Okay, so, so go watch those episodes first and then we'll catch up with today's. Okay, so now that you're all caught up, we're going to follow the same process here that we did in the previous video, which is just start from the definition of the sum and build on all the skills we found solving for Z transforms, uh, or sorry, solving for Fourier transforms uh, to simplify the sums. And I start saying Fourier and I start writing it. So this should be just to start from x2 of n, z to the minus n. And this one looks a little bit weird. This signal is minus negative of one third to the n u of minus n minus 1. Oh, and I should, let's draw the, the silhouette of this signal, a sort of cartoon of the signal first. We say, well, when, you know, when is this going to be 0? The signal will be 0 when u of n is 0. u of n will be 0 if uh, you know, u of minus n minus 1 equals 0 if minus n minus 1 is less than 0, right? When the, the argument of the unit step is less than 0, the value of that function is 0. And so if I solve this, I can add n to both sides, and I'll say that this is going to be 0 if n is greater than negative 1. So this is actually 0 on the right-hand side, but it allows this function to be turned on for the left-hand side. Well, if I'm turned on for the left-hand side and n is minus 1, I get a third to the minus 1. So it starts at uh, the re you know, raising something to the minus 1 power is the reciprocal. So I get 3 with a negative sign. So if I uh, go back and maybe clean this out of the way, probably actually, can I undo that and just maybe it would be better to just move it out of the way. So we'll pull this down out of the way a little bit because the signal that I've chosen here with, I, I, I'll admit it freely, I have a secret ulterior motive. You'll see why we get to the end of the example. But this starts at minus one and then it's zero for all positive time when I draw it silhouette. But as I go to the left, it's going to actually blow up exponentially. It's going to start at minus 3. At the next point, it would be minus times 1 third to the minus 2 power would be, well, 1 third to the minus 2 is 1 over that squared, so that's 9. So I'd be at minus 9, minus 27, and so on. So it blows up. And, and so this is an example where we couldn't find the Fourier transform. The signal it blows up exponentially as we go towards minus infinity. Right, so this is. So we know this sum would not converge for the Fourier transform, but let's see how we can handle this with the Z transform. So the first step, I'll just plug this equation in. Again, very important to keep the minus sign outside the parentheses. That's very important. It's not the signal that's going up, down, up, down the way it would be if the minus sign was inside the parentheses, but rather it's just staying negative and going and minus infinity as I go on. The next step, again, why these cartoons help if we take a little time to figure them out first, is we know I can use this unit step to get to change the upper limit of the sum. We say there's no point in running the sum beyond minus one because everything after that is zero. So I'm going from minus infinity to minus one. I'm going to pull the minus sign out front of one third to the n z to the minus n. And now I can use the same trick as in the previous video and say, well, this is z to the minus 1 to the n. So I can combine the bases. I'm feeling pretty good. Like I'm on my way to getting the answer. But then I look at this and say, oh, this is not the infinite geometric sum I'm looking for. Right? I say, it, it is an infinite sum, and it kind of looks geometric, but I need to to make the limits go from zero to infinity. And they're going like totally against me. They're going minus one to minus infinity. But don't panic, we can solve this. We just need to find a change of variables so that the sum goes from zero to infinity and we can build on that. So our, our next step here, our plan is to find change of variables for the sum, for the index of the sum. So the uh, sum goes, we'll say, we'll call that m, the new, the new index will go m 
from zero to infinity. So if we wanted to do that, we say, well, I, I need, uh, let's stare at it for a minute, because I make m equal to minus n uh, minus 1, right? Because then when the upper limit, right, if I do that, if n equals minus 1, then m is equal to minus of minus 1 minus 1, which is 0. And if n equals minus infinity, right, so negative infinity, my new, my new limit will be uh, minus of minus infinity minus 1. So I have infinity minus 1, which is still infinity, right? So it's a little bit fast on this with the math, but it works. So when I do that, I can rewrite this sum using, using these limits to say is the sum as m goes from 0 to infinity. Because it's a sum, I can flip the order, right? I can add things up in either order, and it's fine. I can go from bottom to top or top to bottom. And I get 1 third z to the minus 1 times, now I have to solve this for n. So I say, well, if I solve this the other way around, then n is equal to minus m minus 1. So I'll put that in for my exponent up here. So take a moment. So that's the change of variables. It's Term by term, it's going to be the same sum as I plug in each value of m. right? So when m is 0 here, I'll get the same term in the sum as I had before when n was minus 1 and so on. So it's term by term, it's the same thing. So it's got to add up the same. I'm just moving it into a form that lets me use my old friend, the infinite geometric series. So when I do that, I'm going to need to do one or two more steps here with using properties of exponents. I'm going to write this as 1 third z to the minus 1 times to the minus m and 1 third z to the minus 1 to the minus 1. So this term doesn't have anything to do with m, and I can pull it out front. So I have minus 1 third z to the minus 1 to the minus 1. I'm going to leave that alone for now, even though it's tempting to clean it up. It will be helpful to have it in that form in a little bit. And now I can say, again, that same property, I can think of this minus m as a minus 1 to the nth power. So when I take that, let me not do too much in one step. So I'll say this is this to the minus 1 to the nth power, right? I can take that apart, moving towards my geometric sum. This whole thing in the middle will be my, my alpha in the geometric sum. So I have minus 1 third z to the minus 1 to the minus 1. And now I take the, this minus 1 in here, I take the reciprocal of everything inside those parentheses. So this becomes uh, 3z. To the nth power. And lo and behold, I have my infinite geometric sum. Now I'm happy. I've got a sum going from 0 to infinity of something to the nth power. So again, this would be like my alpha. So I've got minus 1 third z to the minus 1, the whole thing, well not the minus sign, but everything else to the minus, and this becomes 1 over 1 minus 3z. Right, so now, in principle, I uh, I have this all worked out, but I'm going to... Maybe I did want to flip that. Um, well, I can I can do this now. I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing to get rid of that. So I'll have uh, a minus of one-third z to the minus one. Right, so I'm picking this because it will cancel this out. The minus one exponent and this one will cancel out. But I have to multiply by one, so I need the same thing upstairs and downstairs in my fraction, right? So when I do this, this term cancels the numerator term. And then when I go through the denominator, what happens? Well, this, these two cancel out to give me 1, right? Minus, minus is one, 3 and 1 third, z and z to the minus 1. So that second term becomes a plus 1. And then, and then multiplying it by 1, I just get the same thing back. So after... All the algebraic dust settles. I end up with 1 over 1 minus 3z to the minus 1, which at first is confusing because you say that's the same thing we saw in the last video, right? If I hop back to that page, it's the same expression for z. Here is the key, though. We say, well, when I did this infinite geometric sum, I sort of ran right past it. I forgot to say, when does this converge? What 
values of z make alpha less than 1. Right? So if I'm going to clean that up now, as the exciting conclusion to our story here, right, I need the magnitude of alpha less than 1. And so when I do that, I say I'll have 3z magnitude less than 1. Right, so now I can multiply both sides of this by one third, and the three. Well, I could, if I'm going to really break it out, I'll say I got magnitude of three times magnitude of z because I can take a magnitude of a product apart, and I'm going to multiply both sides by a third. The threes cancel, and I get the magnitude of z is less than one third. So this is where we see sort of the solution to our paradox. We say how could two very different signals have the same x of z, the answer is they have completely different regions of convergence, right? My region of convergence here says z has to be less, magnitude of z is less than a third. If I jump back to that previous page, right, the region of convergence said magnitude of z had to be bigger than a third. So if I think about these in the z, z plane, let me uh, bring up one more page to look at, right? Magnitude of z equals a third defines a circle of radius a third. Right, so this hits the real axis. If I look in this complex z plane, right, I hit the z at the axis at one third. This is a circle with radius a third. What I'm saying is that I've got the same x of z for both. They both had this 1 over 1 minus 1 third z to the minus 1. But what I'm saying is magnitude of z for x1, I'll maybe use color here to show, x1 of z, I had magnitude of z bigger than a third. For x2 of z, I had magnitude of z less than a third. So they, they share the same algebraic expression, but they live in different parts of the z-plane. That I have, the blue one is only valid for the, for the second signal, this expression is only valid inside the unit circle for the first expression it's only I'm sorry not the unit circle it's only valid inside the circle z magnitude of z equals a third the other one is only valid outside that circle right? so again the white circle here is is the set of points whose magnitude complex points whose magnitude is a third and the z-plane that shows in the real imaginary axis that shows up as a circle of radius a third. So they can get away with having the same z-transform because they share who gets to use it where. Inside the circle, the, the, the left-handed signal uses it. Outside the circle, the right-sided signal uses it. Okay, so and we'll see more about this in the pole, why this happens with poles and zeros and regions of convergence in the uh, properties in the following videos. So I'll stop here for now. Uh, that's all for this time. I'll see you in the next video.